morning, 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 everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I'm Sean Butler. Bugs is up in front. This is episode 166 of Tottenham Walks. Pretty short one, I'd imagine, today. But I always say that, and then 25 minutes later, uh, I prove to be disingenuous with my assertions. <laughs> How you doing? Welcome back. Please do me a favour, guys, whilst I wish you the happiness and healthiness of your lifetimes today. Please smash me a like on the video if you don't mind. Smash the subscribe button on the channel if you don't mind. And if you haven't already, hit the notification bell to be the first ones to consume the content. And also, leave a comment. Let me know how you're thinking, how your thoughts are shaping and breaking on the topics of today's video. And I want to start with this news that I saw this morning, a tweet that said that Antonio Conte is going to be awarded the Premier League Manager of the Month. <laughs> for February, I'm guessing. I'd imagine it's for February, it must be. And I, I started to laugh because, you know, the games that would have contributed to him being awarded for that game are Chelsea, West Ham and Manchester City. And... I mean, maybe Fulham? I don't know. I don't know how far back you have to go. But obviously the Leicester game wouldn't have been involved in it, nor would the AC Milan. Although the Leicester game would have been a factor, but because we lost, it wouldn't have helped the cause. And the AC Milan game wouldn't have been a factor because it's not in the Premier League. Of all those games that did contribute to him being nominated, the man wasn't there. <laughs> man was at home with his feet up. I say with his feet up. We don't know, and I guess that's the question, right? How much influence is he having on what happens during the game? I'm of, I'm of no doubt at all that he is, you know, always on the phone to Stellini and any other coaches, figuring out what's going on. And look, you know, formations are formations on paper. During the game, things change. Pivots happen, the, the line could be higher or lower, depending on the individual instructions of the players, depending on the team instructions. You can still participate in a 3-4-3, or a 3-5-2, or a 4-4-2, or a 4-2-3, whatever. You can still have a general shape that looks a certain way on a tactics board, but ultimately the specific instructions can be wildly different during the game for one team versus another and I think that it's clear to me that there has been some very different instructions regarding things like the line the, the depth or the height of the defensive line during the game against Chelsea and West Ham versus what happened against Manchester City certainly Leicester was a bonkers it's not scenario where there was acres of space in between the midfield and the back three or at least Eric Dyer. all sorts of individual things can be unique whilst on a paper the formation could look the same and to me I don't know whether or not those things are managed in game whether Conte has you know a giant iPad on the wall in the dressing room or whatever where he is communicating on behalf of Conte uh, sorry, uh, communicating instead of Stellini at half-time in the pre-game, in the post-game, or whether it's Stellini that's in the charge in the dressing room and giving those instructions, whether he's talking on the phone or texting with Conte. Who knows? No one really knows how much involvement Conte is having in the specifics of the 90 minutes. Du during the week, I'm sure he's very much involved, but for me, all sorts of pivots need to happen during the game. Substitutions, for example. Is that predetermined? If it is... I'm not sure I'm comfortable with predetermined decisions around subs because you're not factoring any of the variables that would happen during the game. If it's not, then who's making those minds up? Is it Stellini that's doing it? Is it Ryan Mason? Is it Antonio Conte via a walkie-talkie? We don't know, but I find it a little bit odd on paper <laughs> that Antonio Conte would accept the Manager of the Month award when the only games that he's been present for, we've lost, and all the games that he's been absent for, we have won. I find that strange. I find it funny. If not, if not um, odd, I find it funny. I, I think it's a hilarious 
uh, scenario to actually have to see pan out that a guy who hasn't been there uh, is given the trophy. And what would he do? Would he would he take Cellini out with him and and shake you know hold both of them in front of the camera? Be interesting to see. He's coming back soon, according to Cellini. Conte says uh, he'll be back maybe next week, the week after. And look, so we're running out of time, I guess, to see how big a sample size we're going to get of what the team does with and without Conte at the touchline. And look, I'm not suggesting for sure, because I don't know, whether or not his absence on the touchline is the variable that makes the difference between our performances. Because there's other things that are going on. Right? There's other things that are happening, whether you're playing at home or away, the quality of the team you're playing against, whether that, the, the other team's um, setup is favourable to what you planned for, or whether it's a surprise and you're being caught unawares by things that the manager has done differently. The individual mistakes of players, the individual performances of players. Uh, there's, like, there's so many different variables, right? But one obvious one is Conte there, Conte not there. So we're running out of time to see if we can continue the form with Stellini at the helm. And I don't think it's anything like a giant enough sample size to make any kind of conclusions. Some people are, some people are saying Stellini ball. I've said it just in jest though, I said it tongue in cheek on streams and things, but you know how I feel. For me personally, I, ca I care about watching good football as my priority. Number one foundation of me enjoying Tottenham Hotspur is to enjoy the football first and then everything else can be built around that. And I think the football's starting to look better. It's not by any stretch of the imagination excellent. The first half is usually still a little bit poor, but I thought against Chelsea, it was better and the second half was better. Certainly the second half against West Ham was good. And it's starting to get a little bit better. And so, you know, not that I still don't believe for a second that Conte will be here next season. I think his mind is done, his, his mind's made up and he wants out, he wants to go back to, to Italy, but whatever happens between now and then if the football improves and gets to a point where it's enjoyable to watch Tottenham for more than moments, then you know there's nothing to complain about from me for, for me it's football first, always um, talking about football we've got Sheffield United first before we play Wolves on Saturday and then Milan in the second leg of the Champions League. And I want to ask you guys about that. Sheffield United second in the championship, seven points I think clear of third place, likely candidates to go up. Good team, good team, although not a brilliant team. They got three goals put past them by Millwall a couple of weeks ago. So let's not be kind of giving them too much credit. We should be able to comfortably handle them with the squad that we've got. And we should also be able to have a conversation around um, formational pivots or tactical pivots or um, players on the team sheet pivots. Is there anything you particularly want to see? I'm not sure how I feel about it, if I'm entirely honest, because I understand the notion that this is our best chance for silverware and how often do you get a, a situation where um, most of the big teams... Morning. Morning guys, when most of the big teams are already out. I understand that there's a craving for a trophy like, you know, you wouldn't believe. And I even understand some people, I was speaking to Danny Kiriakou on Sabbath show on Sunday and he made the argument that for him personally, you should play your best team against Sheffield United, Harry Kane must start, and then if you want to rest or rotate, you then do that against Wolves because he doesn't care so much about the top four uh, and he cares more about winning a trophy. And look, no argument with it. It's a logical argument. It makes sense if you feel the way he does, and I'm sure some of you do, then you would agree that you play your best 11 against Sheffield United and then worry about the consequences afterwards. For me personally, I don't feel quite as strongly because I worry about next season. I, want, I, I worry about how uh, we are going to be able to afford the centre-backs that we need, the goalkeeper that we need to have a real good go next year, absent the Champions League. Because we know, we've seen through the financial statements and we've seen through the 
reports from the chairman that they are self-sustainable models and they are not going to live without you know live live outside of them of their means and so the champions league revenue is essential to generating the revenue to be able to put together a budget that we then either spend correctly or don't and obviously the biggest problem with Tottenham Hotspur is not spending money it's spending it correctly and that doesn't change for the good or the bad um, just because you do or don't qualify for the Champions League they're two different arguments one is are you going to spend the money correctly the other is are you even going to have the money to spend and so I think that uh, we do need to finish top four clearly I think it's a it is a priority and look you know we've got 13 games to go and generally speaking 70 points is enough to finish top four and I think we're on 45 points now people take 46 points maybe so we need eight more wins eight more wins from 13 games gives us 24 points which gets us to 70 points 69 70 points so can you see us winning eight of the next 13 games well we've got some tough ones in there we've got a good run of games but I do think that Wolves is a much harder game than uh, we would normally give it credit for they haven't got a great forward line they can't score goals similar to Chelsea I guess but they're very determined very dogged team a very talented team in the middle and you know they've made light work of teams like Liverpool this season and so I do worry about them a little bit I don't necessarily think it makes total sense to necessarily drop or rotate um, overly used, overly worked players from the FA Cup team for them and then you definitely can't do it against AC Milan if you want to go through then so you have to wait an extra 10 days before you get the chance to play opposition where you might be able to do some more rotation not that we've got that many options to rotate with anyway certainly in the middle you can make the argument for against Sheffield United that you could rest Pape Sar, or sorry, rest either Skippy or Hoiberg and give Pape Sar another chance. And I'd be okay with that. I think that Skippy and Sar did really well against Milan. I wouldn't mind seeing those two. I wouldn't mind seeing Hoiberg and Sar to see what they're like, you know, together as a duo. But again, I don't think Skippy's been worked too much that you need to rest him. Although you've still got to manage that kind of niggling injury a little bit that we don't want to, you know, upset that. But he's only played, what, three games in, in recent times, so... You know, I think he should be okay. But there's an argument there. You can make you can make some changes. I think you could bring Pedro Porro in against Sheffield United. I'm not too worried about um, the threat going forward of Sheffield United, that the aerial threat that he's going to get dominated in the air. I think it'd be good to see Pedro Porro come in for Emerson Royale. Um, I, if you're going to do that, I don't really want to see you play Perisic, but because I, I, I do worry about those two players being too offensive. And again, not that Sheffield United offer too much in the way of threat, but... Um, I know, to see Perisic and Porro, maybe maybe it's maybe it's worth a gamble. Do it if you're going to gamble those two at the same time. Maybe you do it then. But I, I would equally be okay with seeing Ben Davies continue his place out there. Um, at the centre backs, you know, I think that you might see some changes as well. Maybe you see Eric Dyer being rested for Sanchez. You know, maybe you see Tanganga come back in. I, I, I don't know. I don't think playing centre centre back is anywhere near as exhausting as a role. As, um, as playing in the midfield um, or playing up front at the moment for Tottenham. So, because you know the, the, the forward line are asked to do a lot more defending than the, the defence are asked to do a lot more attacking. So, um, I think you could probably get away with that as a back, the same back three. The question for me is: Do you are you ever going to give Harry Kane a chance to have a breather, and are you ever going to give Richarlison a chance to play in his preferred position in the nine where he plays and does it very well for for Brazil? Me personally. I'm not, you know, you know how I feel about Richarlison. I think he was a massive waste of money. I didn't like him at the time. I've never liked him as a football player. I don't think you pay 60 million quid just for someone who's got a little bit of shithousery in their in their personality and also someone that can do a good press better than your, you know, better than the competition in, in Hyung Min's son. But at the same time, I, I still think it's unreasonable to judge him until you give him a run of games in the team. I thought against West Ham he was bang average, but I'm glad that he kept his position for Chelsea. And I thought he did a really good job for Chelsea, although he didn't obviously get the goal or the assist, which is what every striker or every forward you know, should be judged on. There's other parts of the game, and I thought he did a good job in the other areas of the game. Um, I'd like to see him continue to get his place for Sheffield United and 
but I'd like, I wouldn't mind seeing him start in the nine just to see if we what we can do in that situation because if we don't if we never try him in the nine and then in the summer Harry Kane does leave we won't know if we've got Richard, if Richarlison is something of a decent enough replacement or not he's never no one's ever going to be able to replace Harry Kane but something like you know can handle the, the role of responsibilities there I think you have to try him at some point in the nine and I don't see an easier game on paper to do it than against Sheffield United although I understand the the, 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 the opinion I, I totally take the opinion that you know it's our best chance for silverware if it's not broke don't fix it don't rock the boat with you know experimenting in this competition it's too important so I don't know for me personally here's, here's where I land right? my starting 11 would be Foster in goal, Porro, um, Tanganga, oh uh, sorry, Porro, Romero, Dyer, Longley, Davies. I'll keep the back five as they are. I'd go for Saar and Hoiberg in the middle. And I would go for, I think we can try Sonny, Richarlison and Decky on the right. I say that with little confidence in actually thinking whether I do feel that strongly about that 11 because I think any 11 I'll be okay with. I think we're good enough. Let me know your thoughts, guys. If you think there's a bit better 11 out there, a different 11, there's no argument here that the, the, the op every, every opinion is valid in my mind on this one. Like, share, subscribe, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Take it easy as always. Bye-bye.